I just uh, expressing uh, on behalf of myself and Constance our appreciation for you tuning into this webinar and having the opportunity to um, discuss our, uh, our research with you. So here's a quick look at the topics we're going to cover in the uh, talk today. Uh, we'll start out with just a few remarks about um, print management, some of the issues that libraries are facing in that sphere these days. Uh, and then we'll segue into a report that Constance and I uh, produced um, uh, last year, which uses a mega regions framework to think about cooperative print management in the context of a distributed system of regional print collections. Um, we'll also uh, spend some time focusing on the implications of that framework uh, for academic libraries and also for library consortia. And then along the way, we will have a variety of uh, takeaways and conclusions um, that we'll share with you. That we'll share with you. And if everything goes well, we'll leave some time at the end to answer questions and to have some discussion. So when we think about the future of uh, print strategies these days, uh, we tend to think about it in terms of opportunity costs. So on one side of the equation, we have evidence of a declining use of print collections. Uh, and for that evidence, you know, one piece of evidence, I would point you to the study that was done as a collaboration between OCLC Research and OhioLink. Uh, so declining use of print uh, collections, but then also an ever-expanding array of digital al alternatives um, rising up in parallel to that. Um, on the other side of the equation, we have uh, the fact that the resources that are currently being used to support uh, print collections are often needed for other service priorities. So for example, services that encourage a deeper engagement uh, with the workflows of faculty uh, and students. But despite this, this economics, it isn't very likely that um, print collections are going to disappear anytime soon. And, you know, we need look no further than the furor at the New York Public Library uh, recently uh, to see that print collections are going to remain uh, on campus for the foreseeable uh, future. Uh, so instead, I think the goal that we're looking at is to reduce the cost of print collections while leveraging uh, more value from the legacy print uh, investment. Now, discussions on how we uh, actually accomplish that uh, have some way to go. But even at this early stage, I think the contours of a solution are, are starting to emerge. And, there's, and, and from a very broad perspective, I think there's two uh, aspects to that, uh, to these solutions that are being discussed. One is that print resources are likely to be ma um, managed as a shared asset and that they will be managed cooperatively uh, in multi-institutional arrangements. And then secondly, that when you think about this cooperation uh, in discussions these days, it seems that regions are a very attractive scale uh, in which to uh, place that cooperation. Um, there was a report recently uh, published, uh, Cloud Sourcing Research Collections. Um, this was published by uh, uh, my colleague uh, Constance uh, Malthus in OCLC Research. Um, and that offers some evidence to support the idea that collaboration is likely going to be the appropriate strategy for print management going forward. So, for example, one of the findings in the report was that there's a growing overlap between ARL uh, print collections and the digitized corpus of uh, Hadi Trust. Um, furthermore, the study found that um, the print books that fell into this overlap tend to be widely held throughout the library system, and therefore they're at no real perceived uh, preservation risk. So materials like that are prime candidates uh, to be withdrawn from local collections uh, and managed uh, as part of a shared print resource. So this and other findings from the report I think highlight the opportunity for reducing duplication and lowering print management costs um, through collaboration. Um, now, that's the first aspect of this um, uh, solution that we're looking at. The second aspect is the fact that this collaboration is likely to proceed at a regional level. Uh, and it's this aspect of the solution that we address in a report that we're going to talk about uh, in the webinar today. 
So this is the report, uh, Print Management at Megascale, a Regional Perspective on Print Book Collections in North America. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, it was done by myself and, and Constance and our colleague J.D. Uh, Schippengrover. And what we were looking at in this report is uh, the characteristics and implications of a North American network of regional shared print book collections. As I mentioned in the last slide, um, collaboration in shared print tends to coalesce around regional discussions, so that's what we wanted to focus on in the report. But we had to operationalize the concept of a region. You can think about regions from a lot of different perspectives. So to make that concrete, we chose the mega region uh, concept as a way to operationalize uh, uh, the concept of a region uh, in our work. And I'll talk about what a mega region is uh, in just a minute. Uh, I do want to emphasize, however, that the mega region uh, scale that we look at is not intended to be prescriptive. We're not suggesting that this is the right choice uh, in terms of a scale for collaboration in print management. Uh, it is one model among many, and the right model will depend on the particular circumstances of the shared print context that we happen to be talking about. So what is a mega region? Uh, a mega region is a geographic area defined by a high level of economic integration underpinned by robust uh, supporting infrastructure, so transportation, logistics, uh, and so forth. Um, these mega regions are usually characterized um, by multiple urban population centers and their surrounding hinterlands, uh, and they're bound together through, as I said, infrastructure, but also things like mutual economic interests and maybe even cultural uh, similarities. Uh, this concept was um, put forward by um, the urbanist uh, Richard Florida and some of his colleagues, and the way they defined these mega regions was by looking at pictures of countries that were taken from space. So what we see on the slide here is an, a picture from NASA of uh, the U.S. and part of Canada, and here you see lights that show how essentially the populations in these areas have organized themselves, have clustered themselves. So obviously the areas that show lots of bright lights, concentrations of lights, that shows where a lot of people, and therefore by extension economic activities and so forth, are concentrated. And Richard Florida and his colleagues made the point that in a lot of ways this is a much more natural unit to analyze economic activities than to focus on what they might consider you know, artificial political boundaries such as states or provinces or nations. I have a question mark there uh, on the slide. Uh, because you can certainly make a plausible argument that the mega region definition leaves out, uh, to some extent, the importance of governance and administrative um, uh, structures uh, that operate along political boundaries. Um, but even with that uh, caveat in mind, the mega region framework does have the virtue of reflecting the way people and economic activities uh, tend to naturally organize themselves. And because of that, we thought it would be an interesting uh, framework to explore uh, in looking at regional uh, print collections. So this is what the mega regions um, uh, look like. Uh, as you can see, uh, this the way that Richard Florida and his colleagues define these regions as, as a uh, has a uh, strong similarity between that light picture. Actually, I'll toggle back and forth here. If you look at the lights in this picture and then toggle back forward and then look at the, the mega regions that Richard Florida defined, they're, they're very similar. Um, so uh, a couple of things you might uh, notice about these regions. First of all, they all have uh, very catchy names like Boswash and Charlanta and Chai Pits and SoCal, which gives you some indication about their geographical location and the parts of the country uh, that they include. Um, almost all of these regions span uh, state or provincial boundaries. Uh, so you can see, for example, if you look at the Boswash region uh, in the upper right there, it extends all the way from uh, essentially Boston in the north down to uh, Washington uh, further south, and all points in between, including New York City, Philadelphia, and so forth. Um, some of these regions actually span international boundaries as well, three of them, Cascadia, Chai Pits, and Torbuff Chester. Um, so they would include, you know, Cascadia, for example, would extend into Canada to include uh, the Vancouver area. Uh, Torbuff Chester, as its name suggests, uh, includes Toronto um, and the region around Toronto 
Chai Pits, I think, extends over the border to include the, uh, the Windsor area. Now, lest you think that uh, these mega regions are completely um, uh, divorced from any um, uh, kind of connection to the way that libraries actually organize themselves, uh, I wanted to just show this picture where we've, we've overlaid some labels here on the mega regions map that just point out the location of various uh, library consortia uh, that are currently operating. And the purpose here is to show that when you look at these um, essentially regional library consortia, they actually align fairly well uh, with the mega regions um, as Richard Florida defined them. Now, some, they might not necessarily extend to cover an entire region, but they might be fully um, uh, contained within a particular region or spread out across a couple of neighboring regions. So, for example, Orbis Cascade in the northwest fits very well with the Cascadia mega region. Uh, the CIC, uh, the Big Ten institutions, uh, are, with a few exceptions, are spread pretty much over the Chai Pits mega region. Uh, Acerl, um, in southeastern, uh, in the southeastern United States, they're pretty much distrib uh, distributed over the, uh, Charlanta, Stoflo, and New Orleans, New Orleans, hard to say, uh, region. So, again, the point here being that when you look at existing library consortia today, and again, using that as a proxy um, to show how libraries currently are organizing themselves, it does align in a fairly um, uh, reasonable way with these mega regions as, as we've defined them here. So, uh, here's what the consolidated regional print book collections look like, and let me say a few words about how we constructed these. Uh, so, we actually were in contact uh, uh, with Richard Florida and his colleagues, and they were generous enough to share, us, share with us uh, a list of the U.S. and Canadian uh, postal co codes that are used to define each of these um, uh, mega regions. So, what we then did was we uh, took a copy of WorldCat, and we extracted all of the print book holdings uh, that were um, in that particular snapshot of WorldCat, which I think was dated from January 2011. Uh, and we mapped each one of those print book holdings uh, to a postal code, postal code to determine uh, their location uh, and then assign them to the appropriate uh, mega region uh, based on that location. And once all the print book holdings in a region were identified, we then deduped them to produce uh, the consolidated regional print book collection, which is the set of distinct print book publications that are available in each region. Now, note that we're not talking about physical copies here. We're talking about the number of distinct print book publications or manifestations, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Ferber. So we're operating one uh, level of abstraction higher than, than physical copies. So, for example, if multiple institutions um, uh, in a particular region hold a, um, a particular print book publication, that's counted only once in the uh, regional uh, collection totals. And similarly, if an institution has multiple copies of the same publication, again, that's only counted once uh, in the totals for that particular regional collection. So I, I just wanted to make that clear. Now, for reference, we also calculated the size of the North American print book resource, which is the aggregation of all print book holdings in the U.S. and Canada consolidated in the same way as we consolidated the regional collections. So, as you can see, that ended up being a pretty substantial resource of nearly 46 million distinct print book publications uh, sitting on top of nearly 900 million total library holdings. Um, some of the things you might notice about oops, sorry. Some of the things you might notice about these uh, uh, regional print book collections, uh, they vary considerably in size. Uh, so the Boswash collection is the largest, uh, at more than 26 million distinct print book publications and uh, nearly 192 print book holdings. Uh, contrast that to the smallest, which I think is the Phoenix mega region, which only has well a little under four million distinct print book publications and about seven million. Uh, print book holdings. So they vary quite considerably uh, in size. Another thing I want to mention about this, you'll notice the two yellow circles. Uh, we call those the Canadian Extra Regional Print Book Collections and the U.S. Extra Regional uh, Print Book Collections. So obviously not every print book holding in WorldCat can be assigned to um, one of these regions. There's lots of space in between the regions and lots of institutions uh, that populate that space. So what we did was we gathered all of those extra regional print book holdings into um, 
uh, and consolidated them into uh, a collection for Canada and a collection for the U.S. And as you can see, um, those extra regional collections uh, constitute significant print book resources in their own right. Um, and we do, uh, if you go back to the report, uh, we talk about some of the features of those extra regional collections. We're not going to focus on them uh, in, in, in this webinar, uh, but I did want to, um, uh, you know, to acknowledge that we do understand that not every print book holding will fall into uh, one of these mega regions. So it's these consolidated regional collections that served as the foundation of the analysis in our report. Uh, now what I'm going to do now is run through a few highlights uh, from our analysis uh, that I hope will provide some background and context uh, for the second half of the webinar where we'll try to extend some of these ideas to academic libraries and library consortia. So one of the questions we were interested in was the degree of duplication of each regional collection in comparison to the overall North American print book resource, which you remember I said was about 47 million uh, print book titles. So this slide shows the overlap for each regional collection. And it's no surprise that the largest uh, regions tend to have the highest overlap, and the smallest regions tend to have the lowest overlap. If, if you look at this ordering here in the slide, it's, it's pretty close to pretty much running from the largest region to the smallest region. What is surprising, I think, about these results is the large percentage of the North American print book collection that's du duplicated within um, the largest region, which is Boswash. So, uh, in so at nearly 60%. So, in other words, you could, in theory, have access to 60% of the print book titles that are available in North America without ever leaving the Boswash uh, region. On the other end of the scale, we see that very small percentage percentages of the North American uh, collection are available in the regions with the smallest uh, print book collections, consolidated print book collections. So, uh, for example, Phoenix, the Phoenix region, uh, only accounts for about 8% of the titles in the North American uh, collection. So here, we have to draw the opposite inference. If the regional collection um, is treated in isolation, only a small fraction of the overall North American print book resource would be available within that region if you never left that region. Uh, so if access to more titles is needed, these smaller regions need to look outside their regional boundaries for access to materials in other regional collections. So here we start to see how a distributed system of regional collections might start to orchestrate partnerships to improve access on a system-wide basis. Now this slide answers the question of who are the primary custodians of the print book resource uh, in each region? And the big takeaway here is that most of the print book resource in each region uh, is in the custody of academic institutions. So that's represented by the um, orange bars or the orange portion of the bar for each, uh, for each region. Um, we did look at uh, other institutions as well. So the blue portion are public libraries and the green portion is essentially everybody else. Um, so one thing I think that we need to point out here is the significant presence of public libraries as custodians of print books. Uh, in, in some of these regions, um, especially in SoFlo uh, and in Phoenix. Um, these happen to be geographically small regions. They probably have relatively few uh, universities uh, in comparison to the larger regions. Um, but we also note that there's a significant public library presence in some of the larger regions as well. So in particular, Chai Pits, which I think is the second largest region overall, uh, a substantial portion of print book holdings there are in the, in, the, in the custody of public libraries. So the point here, I think, is that it suggests that cooperation among academic institutions within regions on a shared print uh, strategy would benefit uh, by engagement and coordination with some of the public libraries in that region as well, uh, both from a management perspective and also from a, uh, an access standpoint. So one of the interesting features of the consolidated uh, regional collections is the sort of paradoxical result that rareness is common. Um, so I'll explain what that means. Uh, let me explain this figure on the slide. Uh, so on the horizontal axis, we have the percent of each regional collection, which is unique to that region. In other words, it's the, set, the portion of each regional collection that is only available in that region and nowhere else. On the vertical axis, we have another measure of rareness. This is rareness within a region. So it shows the percent 
of each regional collection that's held by five or fewer libraries in that region. Um, so you look at the scatter plot here, and what we get out of this is that rareness is indeed common, uh, both within regions and across regions. So uh, looking at the vertical axis for, uh, axis, for example, in all the regions, at least three quarters of the print book publications are held by five or fewer libraries, which is really a remarkable result. Um, and it goes to show that, you know, within a region, just looking within a regional collection in isolation, um, there's a lot of uniqueness and rareness um, in that um, collection in terms of the availability of materials across the region. If you look at the horizontal axis, we see that significant portions of each regional collection are unique to each region. So, for example, there's a few outliers there. Bowswash, which is the point furthest to the right, 33% uh, of its regional collection is only available in that region. If you look at Torbuck Chester, which is um, just to the left of Boswash, uh, a quarter of that collection is uh, only available in that region. Now, we do have to acknowledge that these numbers reflect institutional collections and institutional holdings as they're cataloged in WorldCat. So there is some uh, a likelihood that there's some deviation between how these collections appear in WorldCat and the reality on the ground. However, even taking that into account, I think we can still infer that rareness is, a, is, an, is indeed common within and across regions, which is, of course, is a critically important parameter in any cooperative print strategy. And the really important thing I think we should take away from this is that we can see that no regional collection can be completely duplicated by another uh, regional collection. Um, even the smallest regional collections uh, are going to have some unique component to them that isn't available anywhere else. Now, here's another way of looking at um, interregional overlap. Um, this figure shows the percent of each regional collection that is duplicated within the largest uh, collection, which is, as I mentioned earlier, was Boswash, uh, the, the region that's highlighted there in red. Um, and I think here it shows that substantial portions of, near, of all the other regions uh, can be du duplicated in Boswash, so particularly when you look at the smaller collections. So, for example, the Phoenix collection, 95% of what's available in Phoenix is also available in Boswash. 93% uh, of what's available in the Denver region is also available in the Boswash region. If you look at SoFlo and, and New Orleans, 92% of what's available in those two regions are also available in Boswash. So this suggests that the largest regional collections can serve as a rough approximation of the smaller collections, which is a key point when you think about potential partnerships across regions in terms of managing supply and meeting demand. Uh, for all print materials. Uh, so, for example, we could, um, uh, you could ask the question, could some or all of the smaller regions' print management needs be outsourced, if you will, to a larger neighboring region whose collection closely approximates theirs? Um, there's some interesting possibilities to think of along these lines, but we also have to remember what I mentioned on the last slide, which is that no regional collection, not even the largest, uh, can fully duplicate another. So each region is going to have some unique component that's going to be their particular responsibility to identify, to curate, and to make available within the broader library system. And then the last slide I want to touch on uh, here, um, this shows how the various regional collections stack up against the digitized print book corpus uh, at Hadi Trust. Um, the, the, the takeaway here is that each regional collection has a significant fraction of its titles already represented in Hadi. Um, so if you look at the ordering of the regions, um, it's basically from smallest to largest. So, um, and I think that's what you would expect. Um, the smaller regions tend to have a higher overlap with um, uh, Hathi, uh, whereas the larger regions tend to have a lower overlap. Uh, so in Phoenix, for example, the smallest region, the smallest collection, a third of their collection is available in digitized form in Hathi. Uh, if you look at the largest collection, Boswash, 14%. Of, of that collection is already available in Hadi. Uh, I think overlap metrics such as this are important in the context of any cooperative print strategy because one of the things you want to consider uh, and what libraries want to know is what kinds of alternative access uh, is available um, to materials before you actually pull those materials uh, off the stacks. So I think this gives you an indication of what's available in one admittedly only one, but a very important uh, digitized corpus. So 
So that um, concludes the uh, uh, whirlwind tour of our report. I'm now going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Constance, who's going to take some of these ideas and dig a little deeper in the context of academic libraries and library consortia. So Constance, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian has already said something about the importance of academic libraries as stewards of the North American print book collection, and I want to uh, discuss a little bit of that in, in greater detail and then look at some ex recent extensions of the mega region's work. So some salient facts as we uh, think about print books and stewardship in the academic library uh, sector, as Brian pointed out already, uh, more than half of the print book holdings in each of the 12 mega regions in North America are held by academic libraries. Importantly, though, uh, the nature of the holding library varies significantly from region to region, and with particular regard to ARL libraries, that is, research-intensive libraries in uh, the higher education sector in North America, whom are uh, typically viewed as the presumptive stewards of our monographic print collections, that sector as a whole uh, maintains just 28% of the regional inventory on average. So that is the part of the regional print book inventory that's managed by ARL libraries in individual mega regions on average. Uh, comes out at only about 28%. Now, ARL libraries are a relatively small part of the academic library community. Uh, in the United States, they amount to perhaps 5% of the total academic library community. Uh, so to the extent that their stewardship man uh, mandate is strong, but their representative uh, grasp of the total inventory is relatively modest, we need to think uh, long and hard about uh, how the role of ARL libraries is like to, like to play into uh, regional print management strategies in the future. On the flip side, when we look at the distribution of print books in non-ARL academic libraries, we find that a significantly a greater part of regional inventory is managed by these uh, uh, smaller academic uh, college and university libraries uh, on average about 35% of the regional inventory. Now, of course, non-era academic libraries may uh, have very strong feelings about the importance of monographic collections, but typically on an individual institutional basis, they have both a limited preservation mandate and limited institutional capacity uh, to assume a stewardship role for monographic collections. So this uh, then, I think, leads us to some interesting questions about whether or not the aggregate inventory in ARL institutions is likely to be sufficient in the future uh, to sustain aggregate demand. If you imagine that many of the libraries in the non-ARL category will be looking seriously at their commitment to management of print collections in the future, that potentially means the concentration of demand on the inventory held in the hands of ARL institutions. So some significant issues there. Further, it raises some very important questions that uh, are increasingly um, coming into to focus, I think, in the academic library community about the business models that will allow for sustainable stewardship when we see this uh, distribution of resource and growing redistribution of institutional uh, stewardship responsibility. These challenges, I think, are brought into particularly high uh, relief when we consider the changes uh, that are happening in the higher education community at large. Uh, one need only think about uh, the increase in globalization that we see in the higher education community, uh, the rise of uh, distance education, and uh, most recently the attention that uh, massively uh, open uh, online courseware is seeing, uh, that there's a concern that the traditional library infrastructure, that is a model in which individual institutions uh, acquire and manage uh, as, as comprehensive as possible a monographic collection, uh, a print collection uh, as possible. That, that model is increasingly viewed as being out of step with emerging trends in the higher education sector at large. Uh, part and parcel of this uh, is a reconsideration of uh, the scale of stewardship responsibility. So I think it's fair to say in this uh, context that institution scale stewardship of print collections is looking increasingly unsustainable for some 
indeed for many academic institutions. So we will clearly see in the future uh, a, probably a substantial number of libraries continuing to maintain a strong print collections and stewardship responsibilities. Nevertheless, if you look at the higher education community as a whole and academic libraries as a whole, we can anticipate some major shifts here. I think increasingly there's an acknowledgement that shared or cooperative print management solutions are likely to be part of the solution here. Uh, what has yet to be determined is the scale at which those kinds of initiatives can usefully be organized. I want to return now to two uh, facets of the academic library uh, print collection at, that uh, Brian has touched upon briefly already. So this is a, a view of the distribution of holdings uh, in each of the 12 North American mega regions uh, across those two broad brush categories of academic libraries, ARL institutions and non-ARL academic institutions. And as you can see, the distribution pattern here is highly variable, highly variable. So if you imagine that the presumptive stewards of our monographic collections are ARL institutions, the institutional capacity from region to region across North America varies considerably. So this, we believe, has important implications uh, for the strategies that are likely to be a good fit in different regional settings. I've called out here uh, for attention uh, the Dallas, Austin, Galston uh, mega region and uh, Southern Florida, SoFlo, uh, because they both notably fall below the 30% uh, coverage in ARL institutions in the original print book collection. Now, as Brian that has something to do with the, the, the resources uh, that are held in public libraries. But from a stewardship perspective, I think this raises important questions about uh, future stewardship of the monographic collections in, uh, in these two regions. Now, if we look instead at the distribution of uh, print preservation uh, solutions, again, focused particularly on the Hathi Trust Digital Preservation Repository because it is such a rich resource of uh, preservation infrastructure, uh, infrastructure for our uh, legacy monographic collections. Uh, it's an interestingly different picture. This, so this is simply a graphical representation of the data that uh, Brian has already shared with us, looking across the regions at the percent of the print book collection that is uh, held, a uh, duplicated that is in digital format in Hathi Trust. And what we see here is that it's a much more even distribution if you look at the preservation infrastructure, the network level preservation infrastructure that is offered by Hathi Trust compared to the institutional infrastructure uh, that is latent, you uh, might say, in ARL institutions. And as you can see here for, uh, for the Dallas Austin uh, mega region and for SoFlo as well, we actually get a little bit more coverage from Hathi Trust than we do from uh, ARL institutions in the region. The more important uh, feature, I think, though, of this particular graphic is, if I say, that kind of flattening. This, this has a kind of load leveling effect for uh, print preservation strategies, I would say, across the board for mega regions in North America. Now, uh, one might say if, in fact, uh, ARL institutions are the presumptive stewards of our monographic print collections, well, why don't we simply look to them to assume uh, wholly this stewardship responsibility. Um, this is uh, particularly uh, interesting in the context of our, our mega regions work, uh, I think, because as this a rather crude overlay suggests, the, uh, each of the 12 North American mega regions does have some ARL coverage. So potentially you could say, let's take this, this significant, uh, the lion's share of the print book collection across North America as it's represented in these mega regions, and then sort out some preservation responsibilities in ARL institutions. Uh, importantly, uh, collectively, that community of ARL institutions, it, it takes us uh, pretty far along in a, a stewardship strategy for uh, the North American print book collection. Uh, so the data here at the bottom half of the slide uh, indicate that by our most recent calculations, so this is uh, as of January of 2013, we're going to say that perhaps three quarters of the print book collection in North America is uh, held by ARL libraries. And as we see, those are distributed uh, fairly nicely across our mega regions. Why not simply uh, put that work in their hands. Well, there are a couple of problems with that. First of all, it's only 73%, right? So we've got a substantial part of the North American print book collection that is not going to be uh, preserved by these presumptive stewards. Further, uh, the academic library community and ARLs 
explicit, uh, are, are, uh, well, ARLs perhaps uh, particularly, are not necessarily likely to band together with a single uh, strategy across ARL libraries to secure this resource. So instead, this brings us back to the observation that Brian made at the outset, which is to look at how we can leverage the kinds of uh, regional uh, cooperatives that are already in place to consider some options for uh, regional print management at mega scale. So this is the map that uh, Brian has already shown to us. Um, uh, I want to, to look at three examples. Um, these are examples that uh, Brian and I have been looking at pretty closely in the last while. Uh, one of the most gratifying uh, aspects, I think, of the mega regions work has been in the last uh, several months, some opportunities that have emerged for extending the framework to think in, uh, in a fairly focused way about how the mega regional framework might play out on a regional basis. So I'm going to look at just three recent examples of this work, starting first uh, with Charlanta. So a substantial collection of the figures there are beneath the map, 10 million print book holdings in the Charlanta region, a population of about 1,800 libraries. We recently did some uh, analysis for the ACEL consortium. This is a consortium of 50-odd uh, uh, research-oriented libraries in uh, the southeastern region of North America. Uh, ACEL overlies the, uh, the Charlotte region quite nicely and uh, has been very much engaged in shared print activities around the journal literature. He's interested in considering uh, how that might play out for the monographic literature. So it was interesting to us and uh, interesting to them to consider what would, uh, what would a shared print approach uh, across the ACERL membership net in terms of benefit on a regional basis, and that's substantial. Uh, by our analysis, and nearly 70% of the print book titles in the Charlanta mega region could be secured if, in fact, some arrangement were struck amongst ACERL libraries uh, to uh, adopt a, a shared print preservation scheme across a relatively small number of institutions. So quite substantial impact. This is particularly interesting in the context of uh, work that ACERL has undertaken and is now um, considering in partnership with the Washington Research Library Consortium, which serves libraries around the Washington, D.C. area, looking at what kinds of new business models might sustain print preservation. So when you think about the number of libraries in the Charlotte region that might potentially benefit from a shared print preservation program enacted by ACERL or ACERL plus WRLC libraries, you start to see some very interesting opportunities for new business models, sustainability models that could secure those collections uh, for the long term. A very different um, but equally interesting opportunity uh, recently with the Skelks Consortium. So this is a, a larger consortium of smaller academic libraries distributed across California, so in Northern California and in Southern California. Uh, Skelks very interested in understanding what the role of its membership might be in print preservation, uh, particularly for, for the monographic collections in California. So we, as we did with ACERL, undertook to look at uh, how much of these regional collections the Skelk Selective Collection might secure, and those numbers are presented here, 28% of Northern California, a significantly greater coverage of Southern California. That's largely because many of the uh, ACERL, excuse me, uh, Skelk libraries are located in Southern California. Now, very different situation here, however, as I say, because Skelk libraries are smaller, not entirely clear whether or not these smaller institutions want to assume a major stewardship role, say, for 50% of collections in Southern California. Nevertheless, the analysis is instructive in suggesting where Skelk libraries might assume a distinctive uh, shared print stewardship role in these respective mega regions. Uh, and finally, I wanted to consider the example of Chai Pitts. This is, the, as uh, Brian noted, the second largest of the mega region uh, collections in North America. Uh, very interesting overlap there with membership of the CIC, which is, uh, what, 13 libraries now plus some others. Uh, if we look at the collective collection there of CIC libraries and consider uh, where they might fit in a regional strategy, again, very substantial, not dissimilar from what we saw um, 
for ACE oral, but with a much smaller population, we're covering almost 60% of print book titles. Now, this is particularly important because the CIC, as many of you will know, has already been uh, very much engaged in activities around shared print management of journals and is now interested in extending that work to consider monographic collections, CIC libraries, ARL libraries, all of them very interested in assuming uh, their res rightful respective roles in print stewardship. So sorting out how amongst that class of institutions uh, to redistribute print preservation for monographic literature particularly interesting. And in fact, um, Brian and I are very excited about some work that we've undertaken in partnership with the CIC and with uh, the Ohio State University to consider the role of institutions and consortia in regional print management schemes. So we've undertaken uh, some joint work there to consider the role of an individual institution, the Ohio State University, the consortium, CIC, and where those fit within a regional print uh, preservation strategy for the Chai Prince region. So some very interesting opportunities there to consider uh, what counts as a distinctive resource on an institution level, on a consortium level, on a regional level, where are there opportunities to reduce redundant investment, and uh, where can we identify uh, natural synergies amongst institutions that will be suggestive of uh, important roles for individuals and uh, library, uh, consortia of libraries. Now, just some final uh, points. I want to reiterate from, from what has preceded here, um, as has been, I think, abundantly clear, particularly in uh, the data that Brian shared with us, there are some striking asymmetries in the distri distribution of print books in North America, so a lot of spikiness in the distribution. Not only the concentration in mega regions, but the differences across those mega regions, very notable in thinking about uh, the kinds of appropriate print management strategies that are likely to emerge in these different uh, geographies. Uh, clearly, in this uh, presentation, we've been very much focused on the implications of all of this for academic libraries, which hold the lion's share of the monographic corpus, but uh, as we suggested, changes in the higher education space are likely to accelerate some changes and redistribution of uh, print stewardship responsibilities across the academic library sector. For research libraries in particular, we think this has very important uh, implications for rethinking uh, individual and collective roles in uh, long-term preservation of regional and uh, the collective North American uh, print book resource. However, as we've already seen, regional research libraries cannot do this work uh, entirely on their own. They don't hold everything, and in any case, uh, the business models that would ensure that uh, ARL libraries alone would retain these materials are quite uh, problematic to sort out. We do believe the cooperative infrastructure uh, as embodied in these large-scale regional consortia that we've just been discussing uh, provides some interesting uh, infrastructure that could be uh, potentially leveraged to maximize both coverage from a preservation point of view of, of uh, regional collections, but also uh, in these multi-type uh, consortia potentially provide um, some interesting natural experiments for sorting out some of these uh, emerging business models. And uh, finally, uh, simply the observation that we believe that stewardship models will have to be sorted out in, uh, at varying different scales, right? So there will be roles for individual libraries. There will be uh, different roles for groups of libraries. And we uh, believe very strongly that there will be some need for network scale solutions to redistribute more effectively, more efficiently stewardship across the library system. And with that, um, I'd like to uh, save these last few moments for uh, discussion with uh, those of you who've uh, joined us, and uh, we'd be glad to entertain questions uh, through the chat window. I know some have, have come through already. And uh, um, since there's a, a couple of questions that have been uh, uh, sort of asked and answered on the on the chat monitor, but it, but, but it might be uh, useful to just say a few more words about them because uh, they're, they're very important questions. Um, one had to do with the boundaries of the Vega regions, and someone pointed out that um, you know certainly these these boundaries would be in flux, and that that's absolutely true. Um, I suspect that um, they're not in such a rapid state of flux that uh, it would um, impact the analysis. But uh, we certainly do need to um, uh, keep in mind that over time the, the boundaries of these regions will change. 
Uh, another thing to, to point out in terms of boundaries, um, they're not, you know, it's not like when you think of a mega region, it's not like you draw a bright line on the map and anything in the region is in the region and anything outside the line is, is, is not. I mean, obviously you have institutions that uh, are situated right on the border of, of a mega region and probably have, you know, because of that proximity, they are, for all intents and purposes, integrated into that region as well. You also have um, institutions that, even though they're geographically um, dispersed from a region, um, uh, they still, because of consortial arrangements, uh, they still have active engagement with uh, a cohort of institutions within a region. So a good example of that is uh, CIC. Um, as, as we mentioned, most of those institutions are in the tri pitts region. But you have some uh, other institutions, uh, like the University of Nebraska, for example, which is not in a mega region, but obviously would be actively engaged in collaborations with um, the other CIC institutions. So it's good to, keep, good to keep that in mind. Um, the other question, which I think it might be worth touching on, the question was asked, um, when we think about these cooperative arrangements, are we talking about uh, exclusively a shared preservation responsibility, or are we talking about preservation and access? And my uh, response was, I think our basic assumption is both, but you could imagine preservation-only um, uh, situations as well. Constance, do you want to say a few more? Uh, well, well, I would agree that we, I think our, our uh, presumption going into this was that um, in, for monographs in particular, we think that there's um, – need for strategies that will combine preservation and access. And in fact, one of the, the driving forces behind our interest in the mega regions framework was that uh, a regional strategy that leverages infrastructure on a mega regional basis. So as, as Brian uh, said at the outset, mega regions being characterized by this high degree of economic uh, integration uh, underpinned by very robust infrastructure does mean that within a mega regional construct you potentially have greater infrastructure for moving materials around. And for monographs, this is particularly important because, well, because of two things. One, as we've seen, uh, the, the uh, distribution of, of resource for monographs, the, the inventory on a regional basis is relatively slim. You don't actually have, on average, very many copies of, uh, that is, very many library holdings for a given title. So to the extent that you want to, to leverage that resource effectively, you need to move those copies around. To move those copies around, you need logistics infrastructure and consortia that make that easier. And then the other piece of that I think that's important to bear in mind is that uh, monographs are a, a, a class apart from, from journals, from a, from a preservation and access uh, point of view. Now, we've in this session been, been uh, focused quite a bit on the, the high degree of duplication between print books and uh, digital surrogates, digital preservation surrogates in, in the Hadi Trust Preservation Repository. Uh, that is uh, largely a preservation value, right, because much of that material is still in copyright. So unlike the journal literature where we can imagine preservation strategies uh, that are that, that a strategy for print is really about preservation because so much of the access now has transitioned to the digital environment. For monographs, we're not there yet, even for the substantial part of the monographic literature that has been digitized. Much of that content is still locked up. So we need a strategy that ensures uh, stewardship, sustainability of that resource, that also enables uh, a better flow of that resource on a regional and indeed on an inter-regional basis. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what would be the rationale for print management at a regional scale rather than a crowdsourced approach, uh, perhaps coordinated at a North American scale, facilitated by infrastructure at HADI, OCLC, PAPR, so forth? Why regions, not clouds? What components of library services can't be satisfied by a crowdsourced approach? Um, it's an interesting question. I don't know that we have a, the, an answer necessarily. Um, I think um, one of the things to take into account is that in, within this uh, framework that we're talking about, we're still talking about physical inventory, um, you know, so books on the shelves. And uh, it, it's difficult to, um, 
to, to work out how you could coordinate a completely fragmented um, program of preservation and access, um, just working with individual institutions. It seems that rolling them up to regions and then coordinating across regions might be a more fruitful or an efficient approach. But again, that's an untested, that's just speculation, it's an untested proposition. Uh, I don't know, Constance, do you? Um, well, uh, you know, I, I think it's, uh, this gets back to, to some of what we were struggling with at, at the outset with this research, which was having undertaken, as, as Brian uh, suggested, the work on uh, cloud sourcing, which looked at opportunities around uh, consolidations of, of uh, shared resources, physical consolidation of uh, resources coordinated on some higher order, so using uh, specifically as the model there the kind of large-scale aggregation that's um, been made possible through through Hadi Trust, how you could you work that out for print. I think that um, coming out of that, we, we felt pretty strongly that for the monographic literature, uh, for any number of reasons, uh, you know, ranging from uh, the, you know, deep symbolic uh, importance of uh, local print books uh, at, on the shelves of academic institutions to these concerns about the depth of the resource. So, as I say, for, for print books, maybe less redundancy um, than, than might be anticipated on a regional uh, scale, the inability to, to fully transition to electronic uh, distribution models led us to believe that in this case uh, for monographs, uh, a regional strategy might be one to work out. Now, we don't, as, as uh, Brian pointed out at the beginning, this is not at all meant to be prescriptive. We're not suggesting necessarily that mega regions are the appropriate regional scale. Uh, it was simply um, a useful uh, model for for operationalizing some of our uh, analyses on on distribution of resource and and available available infrastructure. And then I think the other important part of that is that. Uh, for uh, enacting a strategy, a, a cloud-based strategy for, for uh, the monographic literature right now, uh, oh, you're right that uh, Hadi Trust might be an agent for some of that work. Uh, Hadi Trust is, after all, a, a, a membership organization. To the degree that their preservation work benefits everybody uh, without respect to, um, without respect to, to preservation, Excuse me, with that respect to membership, um, that, that's 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 different from from the value, uh, the enormous value that I'm sure Hadi Trust will will provide in a in the shared print scheme because that's um, well, it's likely to be organized by a different kind of of business model, isn't it? So I think um, I think rising from the regional scale to a, a network scale for for print books is is going to be a, a challenging one, but it, you know, we're, we're still looking at that. Um, the question was asked, uh, what about subject-based repositories instead of regional? Um, very good question. Again, um, you know, going back to what Constance said, you know, we're, we're proposing one model among many potential solutions, and the right approach will depend on specific circumstances. Again, I think um, we're talking about an environment where um, individual institutions are still uh, managing local inventory. Uh, so, you know, rather than uh, simply consolidating, uh, uh, you know, corpuses of, uh, of print books related to particular subjects or particular locations. So it seems to me in that context, um, a subject-based approach would not work very effectively. But it's, you know, again, I mean, it's, it's another model that could be considered. Um, it could be considered, you know, you could have a hybrid of both, a subject-based yeah. approach on a regional uh, level. Yeah. So. Although, interestingly, when we when we examined the distribution uh, from a subject basis of the regional collections, say, largely, um, it would be difficult to say, you know, Boz Wash is really where all the history books are, and, uh, you know, um, well, I guess that, that would be a combination of, of the two approaches. But it wasn't apparent from, from our analysis that there would be any uh, natural ways to organize those, those subject-based questions, although that's something I think we're interested in exploring on a regional level within the CIC piece, right? So we are very interested in understanding where are their distinctive uh, 
uh, clusters of related subject-based monographs that would be suggestive of natural institutional roles that don't that are not disruptive, right? So you wouldn't march into an institution that is, has a you know exceptionally fine American literature collection and say now you're responsible for early Chinese history, right? You want to leverage the strengths that institutions already have. Well, uh, we see that the hour is, is uh, struck here at 4 p.m., so um, uh, we will turn it back over to uh, our uh, MC, uh, Melissa, to uh, uh, close this out.